Wilhelm Canaris. This is a guy that most people probably have never heard of. He doesn't have any of the notoriety as people like Himmler, Goering, or Goebbels has. So I think it's important to start by saying, who is this guy and why is he important? Anthony, do you want to start off? Canaris was a spy. He operated in the shadows to some extent. And in terms of his career and his ideology and his actions, He's an opaque figure. I'd like to pick up on that. I think that too often with the Third Reich, these characters can be painted in black and white. And here we've got a, a, a figure who's got so many shades of gray. There's so much ambivalence here. And actually for historians, it becomes a really interesting figure to, uh, to look at. So what muddies the water with Canaris? We know that Canaris was opposed to aspects of the German war effort. And we know that he acted to undermine Hitler and Nazi Germany. For me, he becomes a particularly interesting figure because he's been so good at keeping secrets about himself uh, under wraps. It seems that nobody on either side knows exactly what his motives are. Historians aren't able to understand his goals. Psychologically speaking, that actually itself says something to me about the type of person he likely was. I think he raises really big questions about how we would all behave in wartime. Uh, he's obviously got a really plum job and he wants to keep it, yet at the same time, some of what he sees he finds morally repugnant. There, there's so many ways of interpreting Canaris' career and his actions, and so therefore I think we really need to drill down very deeply. I'm starting my investigation at the German Spy Museum in Berlin. I want to find out as much as I can about Canaris' tenure as Hitler's spymaster, both before and during the Second World War. Spying is famously called the second oldest profession in the world. Yeah, it definitely is. Florian Shimakovsky is a scientific associate here. So where are you taking me to? We're now going to the Second World War section, That's where people like Canaris uh, were working. Canaris is the head of the Abwehr. That is the German military intelligence unit. And he's the boss. It's his job to gather military intelligence. The Abwehr has its tentacles in lots of parts of the military all over the Third Reich. It's a really big player. What are we looking at first? We're going to have a look at this spy radio set especially ah. constructed for agents of the Abwehr operating abroad. Wow, so that's an actual Abwehr radio. Yeah, and as you can easily see, it has been in use. Spying is all about getting your intel back to home base. That made this a vital tool of the trade. The Abwehr only produced like 500 pieces of this radio. So it's very rare then. It's, it's quite rare, actually. It's built like a tank, so it's really hard to, <laughs> to, to destroy. They used to throw radio sets like uh, this um, down from planes with parachutes. We've got okay. a parachute just above us, actually. OK. Because it was complicated to smuggle the radio sets inside. So the agents would have already infiltrated the country, and then they would wait for the radio to come after they'd arrived? Most of the times. You can see. The writings are in English to disguise where the radio was actually uh, coming from. So when an agent gets caught with the radio, uh, they don't follow it yeah. back to Germany. You see the Morse button down here. Canaris and the Germans wanted to get hold of as many secrets as possible. They wanted military secrets. They wanted to get hold of technological secrets. Countries have been doing this to each other for centuries, millennia. Radios like that, where were they being used? They have been used by German agents working in France, Great Britain, or even in the Eastern countries to spy on people and to send their messages home. The other half of Canaris's job was to prevent enemy spies from gathering German secrets. I understand that one of the jobs of the Abwehr led by Admiral Canaris was counterintelligence. Canaris arranged the whole Abwehr system's counterintelligence. That was one of their tasks, yes. What sorts of periods of history? Under Canaris, Abwehr counterintelligence agents were sent to infiltrate enemy spy units to destroy evidence and spread misinformation. This was real-life cloak-and-dagger work that called for secret weapons from the pages of a spy novel. So we opened it up there. You can actually yeah. see the constructions inside. It was a one-bullet gun with just a small bullet, just four to six millimeters, but sometimes that could be the bullet that saves your life. 
So this wouldn't be maybe a gun to really do an assassination, but more kind of a self-defense. So if you get disguised as a spy, maybe that bullet gets you free. So something to defend yourself if you were suddenly discovered. Yeah. Can I uh, get my hands on of this? Of course. Thank you very much. Wow. It's amazing. It's quite heavy for a pipe. So if you want to fire it, you have to remove the mouthpiece and the security wire. So this is like the equivalent of a safety catch. Exactly. If you want to fire it, you have to hold it and then twist. So you'd be given this already preloaded with a bullet. Yeah. And then if you needed to use it, you would then remove this safety catch. Exactly. And then you would aim it at your target and twist this and it would exactly. fire. Yeah. Wow. You can fire a single bullet that might save your life. And I imagine if I needed to use this, I would have to be pretty close to the subject. Yeah, because uh, with really small bullet guns, uh, the distance where it's really aiming correctly is like 10 to 15 meters, and after that, it gets complicated. You'd have to be in quite a bit of trouble to use this thing. You only get one shot, you don't get a second chance. And I would not want to have to use this. This was the world of espionage in the 1930s, with Wilhelm Canaris sitting like a spider at the heart of a vast